Good morning, Vallejo Drive family, and our, especially uh, we would like to welcome our guest this morning. God, may you be gracious to us and bless us and make your face to shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the people praise you, God. May all the people praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the people with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the people praise you, God. May all the people praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will revere him. in our midst. Accept our worship, our thoughts, and our words, and change us into the image of your likeness. In the strong name of Jesus we pray, amen. Please be seated. Good morning, Vallejo Drive. It is good to see you this morning as we celebrate today the ordinance of 
humility, and ordinance of communion. There are a couple of things I just wanted to bring to your attention. Today, of course, is our North American Division Women's Ministry Day, and we want to encourage the women of our church to, to think about getting more engaged. There is a, um, a women's ministry retreat for the Southern California Conference the weekend of October 5 through October 7. And uh, the title for the conference is Identity Theft. Identity Theft. And so if you just talk to Alma to get more information about that conference. And then of course, there's another conference that's coming up um, in September, I believe it is. And I have the dates here, hold on. It is the entire North American Division Conference that's in September of 2019. And of course, we'll have time to get you more information about that. Next Sabbath, right after church, my wife and I would like to meet with all of the parents of adult children for 10 minutes of prayer. You know, when our children become adult, we only hope that they remember everything we've taught them. But they sometimes tend to go their own direction. So we're trying to decide which room we're gonna have this prayer in. I just want to get a show of hands. If, if you have an adult child and you wanna join us for just a moment of prayer together as a family, just lift your hands so we can kind of get a sense for how much space we're gonna need. Okay, very good, thank you. So we'll probably take one of the rooms right next door and it won't be there for long, but we invite you to come and join us for that prayer. Um, my wife and I, we pray for our adult children, we pray for our adult nieces and nephews um, on a daily basis, and so we want to make sure that we have that opportunity to join us in that prayer. Elder, do you have something you want to add to us? We uh, have a special guest that slipped in the back door a few minutes ago, and I want to take the moment to welcome Ivers and Yuta uh, Oslins. They were former associate pastor here. They were with us for over two decades, and they don't get here very often from the Philippines. We just want to say welcome. Stand up so people can see you, so they can say hi to you. Okay. It's our prayer today that as we worship together, that God will do something unique and special in our lives. This service is not about feeding you, on a physical basis. You probably want a bit more to eat for lunch than what we're gonna provide in communion. It is really about galvanizing our thoughts and minds around the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. God bless you as we worship together. invite all the kids to come forward for the children's story. You know, this is one of my favorite parts from coming to church. I get to see all your faces here. And some of you I get to see in Sabbath school, but a lot of you I don't. And today, I want to tell you a story about... I thought Olivia was going to say something. Okay, I want to tell you a story about important people. Now I wanna, I'm going to show you something. And I want you to tell me what kind of important person would wear this. 
Anybody has an idea who would wear this? Mm, Kayla. <laughs> I know that Kayla knows. Does anybody else have an idea who would wear this? Mm. It's okay if you're not 100% sure, but if you have an idea, let's see, Caleb. Veteran. A veteran, okay. It looks like a uniform, yeah. And you see all those things there, the front? They look like flags, yes. They're called ribbons, and they're like um, awards for doing important stuff. So yes, this uh, military officer would wear this. So someone that has a high rank in the military would wear this. Now, I have another question. Do you know who would wear this? Uh, the US Army. Okay, yes, it looks like an army uniform. Yes, Caleb. Someone in the Air Force. Yes, <laughs> someone in the Air Force. Yes, it looks like a soldier uniform. So a soldier might wear this. Okay, now, hold on, one more question. Who would wear this? Yes. A queen and a king. A queen or a king, okay, nice. And now this is my question. If you got to wear any of those outfits, the kingly robe or the officer coat or the brave soldier uniform, and I told you I'm going to trade you for this. You wanna touch it? You wanna touch it? You can touch it. Does it feel soft? No. <laughs> no. Does it feel a little itchy? Yeah. Yes. Who would trade the fancy uniform for this one? Okay, good, I see some girls. Why would you trade it, Lanessa? I don't know. You don't know, okay. <laughs> um, well, yes, Caleb. Because I don't wanna be famous. You don't wanna be famous, okay. Caleb? Because I don't wanna be famous either. Okay. <laughs> what these uniforms that I showed you or these special things that I showed you there have been people in the Bible that had to wear similar things to that and they had very important jobs that God gave them but some people in our Bible wore things that looked just like this and they had also important jobs there is one person that Pastor Kyle is going to talk about today that he lived in a palace and he had fancy things and he could marry the most beautiful girl in the whole kingdom and he decided to leave all of that and go live in the middle of the sand for 40 years no fancy things no palace just the middle of nowhere in the heat with a bunch of whiny people. Does that sound like a good trade? Not to me, <laughs> but he did it because God asked them to. So sometimes God will ask us to do things that sound hard and we need to trust them. And sometimes we have really nice things and that's okay because God wants us to have nice things and God wants us to be happy but sometimes he will ask us to do something hard. So I want you to remember today that even if you feel like you're going through something hard, God is still there. He's still holding your hand. And he still wants to be part of your plan, okay? No children's worship today, but I hope to see everybody on Monday for our BBS. You wanna say that? Jesus rescues? Yes. She wanted to tell us that Jesus rescues. Yes, we hope to see everybody here on Monday at 6 o'clock in the afternoon for our BBS. And we're going to have a lot of fun. You may go back to your parents.
the deacons may come forward at this time. Um, as devoted as we are to the financial support of our local ministries here in Glendale, the Vallejo Drive Church family is also committed to the support of ministries at the local conference level, the regional union level, the North American division, and the general or worldwide conference level. Today, we are calling for the support of North American Division's Women's Ministries. And this ministry department was set up to provide opportunities for women to deepen their faith and experience spiritual growth, to promote opportunities for wider service for women, and to develop resources for local church women's ministry directors. Our local women's ministry director is Alma Wesley. If you've never met her, uh, please seek her out and introduce yourself. Uh, many of you have participated in some of uh, these events and programs that Alma has organized. Today is our opportunity to support this ministry on the North American Division level. Please mark your tithe envelopes with NAD Women's Ministries. The loose and unmarked offerings will go toward ministries here at the Vallejo Drive Church. Father in heaven, we uh, thank you always for your blessings to us, for the abundance which you've blessed us with. And uh, out of both our need and our abundance, we wish to uh, support this work and we wish to support our local congregation as well. Please uh, bless and um, multiply these offerings to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The deacons may now collect the offering.
Let us come reverently to the throne of grace for the morning main prayer. Those of you who are able, please kneel. Father God, we thank you that you are God. We thank you that you sent Jesus to be our savior. We thank you that you sent the comforter to be with us to communicate back to you our needs. We thank you for the fact that we are alive this morning and we can come to church on this beautiful day to worship you. May our prayers and our songs and our rejoicing ascend to you as sweet smelling incense. Father God, we know we are living in the end times with all the strife and discord throughout the world. But you have, you have promised your people that you will protect us, you will keep us safe from harm and danger. Continue to give us the faith that we need to live in these dangerous times. Be with us as we worship you in the celebration of communion. Be with us as the pastor brings us a sermon that we need to nourish our soul. We ask in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
If there's anyone right now sitting someplace where you cannot hear me, would you just raise your hands? We're trying to test some things to make sure everyone can hear. If you cannot hear me, just raise your hand. <laughs> just testing, just making sure you're, you're paying attention. Let's pray together. Lord, as we now open up your word, bless us in the study of this message for us. Help us to understand what you're calling us to. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to spend just a few minutes on the subject of walking into your destiny. Walking into your destiny. Now, you should always be concerned when a pastor says he wants to spend a few minutes. John, how are you? Uh, I, I do want to spend just a few minutes. I define few, perhaps differently than some of you may define few. <laughs> but we will we'll be out soon because we still have our communion to do. What is the significance of the death and resurrection of Jesus? I want you to look at a, a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13 and 14. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and our faith is also empty. Everything we hold and believe in is connected to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Christ did not die and raise from the dead, then there's no need for a church and there's no need and no hope of salvation. So what does the resurrection of Jesus provide for us? We find in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9, it says, by grace, you have been saved through faith and not that of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are saved by grace. You should say amen to that. Therefore, good works are not the reward of salvation, they are a sign that you've been saved. And in fact, anyone whose life is unchanged may need to examine themselves to ask, have I actually really been converted? Because if you show nothing in your life, if no one can tell before conversion or after conversion was any different in your life, you may need to wonder, did it actually happen? But there's another passage in this relationship in verse 10 that I want to read to you. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. The fact that we are God's workmanship means that it's not our labor, not our effort, that God made us. And in fact, reading from Anders in his commentary, he says, if we could earn salvation by our own good works, we would not be the work of God. We would be the work of ourselves. And there are many people who are content to be the work of themselves rather than the work of God. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. This new creature status implies that our lives should be full of good deeds and good works. Now, we are not saved to be put in the refrigerator. We're saved to be put on the frying pan. When God calls us, he calls us to action. He calls us to engagement with society. And many Christians are content to just wait in a fridge for Jesus to come one day and open it up and thaw you out. It doesn't happen that way. If you're not on the front lines doing what God has called you to do, you might miss something very, very important in your life. We are walking in these good works, it says, and we need to understand that it says prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are walking in our destiny, are you? You see, God set aside works for you before you were born and before you were converted, works that he wanted you to walk in. We are created not just for the general works of a Christian, faith, forgiveness, tithe, offerings. Those are the general works that every redeemed person should have. 
but we are also been called for specific works, ordained for each one of us. So the question that I want to raise is, are we walking in our mission? Are we walking in our destiny? Just as the 12 disciples had a unique path that each of them had to walk to their destiny, each of us has been called on a unique journey for our destiny. Discipleship, it is not inactive, it's never lazy, it's never mute to the sufferings around us. If we are truly disciples, our ears will be in tune with what's going on around us when people are hurting. Some of those people who are hurting are hurting right in the walls of this church. And true discipleship reaches out to those folks. Edmund Burke once used these words. He said, the only thing necessary for, tr for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Ladies and gentlemen, good men and women cannot do nothing. So if you are doing absolutely nothing to make this world a better place or make someone around you a happier person or just touching someone who's, who's, who's hurting, then the question has to be raised, are you indeed one of those good people? I want to take some time to kind of talk about our destiny this morning, because I think it's so important for us to think about where we're going and how we're going to get there. Do our works demonstrate the salvation of the Lord working out in our lives? Because every good work, every act of charity is a demonstration of the grace that we have received. Either we've received that grace and therefore it's manifest by how we live or we have not. If you're not living out the grace of God, then the question is, have you really thoroughly accepted the grace of God? So Philippians puts it in a different way. It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to do what? Are you reading with me? Both to and to... Okay, if you just touch your neighbor and just find out if they, do they still have a pulse, just make sure, because we really don't want to preach to dead people, so just make sure that person is still, okay. Both to do what? To, and to, to do what? All right, very good. There's life at 300 Vallejo Drive. Praise God. Okay, so... He works in us, and, he, and we are told we need to work out our salvation. The salvation we've been given needs to be manifest in how we live. So God is telling us, work that out, because God is, wants to do not only your will, he wants to do something in you. So he changes your mind, and then he changes how you live. Now, let me look at um, Patriarchs and Prophets. I'm going to go back and give you the first part of this, Now I'll give you to the screen. It says, this is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 486. It says, human effort avails nothing without divine power. And without human endeavor, divine effort is with many to no avail. To make God's grace our own, we must act our part. His grace is given to work in us, to will and to do, but never as a substitute for human effort. God does not substitute for our effort. So let's give you an example. You remember James talks about the fact, he says, if you see a man or a woman who is hungry or cold, you don't walk by them and say, be warmed and blessed, and you keep walking, right? If they're cold, you give them a blanket. If they're hungry, you give them food. And many of us want to have, um, it's kind of like digital digital service, where we, we watch what's going on in the world on our televisions, our computers, and we, we say to ourselves, boy, that's really terrible. And we think because we've empathized that we've done all we can. Now, you can't feed every hungry person on the planet. God didn't ask you to do that. But how about the hungry person right next to you? How about the person right there on your street? How about those just right here in Glendale? There's something we can do for them. 
Another comment came from the book Ministry of Healing, page 176. It says, God has given us the power of choice. It is ours to exercise. We cannot change our hearts. We cannot control our thoughts, our impulses, our affections. We cannot make ourselves pure, fit for God's service. But we can choose to serve God. We can give him our will that he will work in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Thus, our whole nature will be brought under the control of Christ. Some other Bible on this, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul speaking, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling, worthy of the calling which you were called. Again, in chapter 5, he says, see then that you walk circumspectly not as fools but as wise redeeming the time because the days are evil if you don't think we live in evil times you may be in a coma these days are truly a mess and they get messier every day we have a we've now developed a certain kind of um, saturation point my wife and I for the news. At a certain point, when we just feel it, we cannot listen to it anymore. It's just too messed up. It just starts to depress us. And some of you were riding the car the other day and this newscaster was on, and I switched the channel. My wife said, well, it's about time. <laughs> Glad you finally got that. We, we live in a time that is really messed up. But the question I want to ask you, if we live in such evil days, are we walking in our destiny? Did not God anticipate the evilness of our times and brought you to life in these times for a special reason? So the question I would ask is, are we, I'm having problems here. I lost the slide, here we go. Oh, never mind. Are we walking in our destiny? Are we demonstrating the compassionate acts of God that he has for us? Now I want to spend some minute here talking to you about my experience in terms of this walking in our destiny. I went to college as a pre-med major but I wasn't converted. Why did I want to be a doctor at 18? Well, it's pretty simple. I wanted to drive fast cars <laughs> and run with fast women. Well, I got half of that. My wife let me drive a lot of fast cars in my time. But I wasn't, I wasn't ready to be a doctor. I wasn't even ready to get saved. So at the end of my freshman year, because of the ministry of a week of prayer, I found the Lord, and I became a theology major. I need to let you know that all the people who knew me were incredulous. Even strangers were incredulous. I, we had a college days where people come from the academies, and I was sitting at a table, and around the table, everybody started saying, well, what, should, what are you going to do? And everybody was telling them what their major was. And they asked me, well, what are you going to do? I, well, I'm a theology major. And they all fell out laughing. God, from the day I accepted his will for my life, took me on an adventure. Later in my life, I found myself standing in Red Square in Moscow or on a Navajo reservation few years ago as a chief medical officer there or in South Korea doing a lecture on social security system or being the pastor of the Vallejo Drive Church. None of this was my plan. I had no idea that this is where God was going to lead me. But God has a plan for your life individually. And some of us have not stepped into our destiny. 
we're going to talk about how to do that. The question we have to ask ourselves as we close, are we prepared to be and do what God wants us to be and do? So let me read you an example of someone else. It's found in our scripture reading, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. You have that in your Bible, so let's go ahead and turn there. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Now, you may recall that Moses was a kind of reluctant traveler along the path that God had for him. He first messed up by murdering an Egyptian. He then went to sheep school and spent 40 years tending sheep. When the burning bush started burning, he was only full of excuses as to why he could not go and do what God told him to do. Yet, in the end of the story, Moses was able to liberate the people of God from Egypt. How was that possible? Because Moses made a choice. He decided to say yes to God. Now, Moses never saw it coming. Moses had not ever imagined himself as a deliverer of Israel. He never went to deliverer's school and got a degree. Yet God used him in an unusual way. So I want to give us this word of hope. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. God is going to lead you in some places, if you allow him, that you would have never, ever thought. Let me give you an example. I think that many of us are afraid to go where God leads. And so we don't want to hear God talking about change or talking about doing some unusual ministry because we're, we're basically a little afraid. David. God's destiny for David was that he was going to go fight Goliath. Everybody was afraid to fight Goliath but one person, David. And yet he went forward. He stepped into his destiny. And I'm sure he was afraid because courage is not the absence of fear. It's operating in the presence of fear and still moving forward. How about the three Hebrew boys? When the trumpet sounded, they had the courage to stand. Everybody was afraid to stand except these three young men. And God blessed them. I think sometimes we're just too chicken to do God's will. We know that God has something special for us to do and we say, I don't want to do that special thing because I might get hurt. When I joined the United States Army in the, as a, in the medical corps, I recognized that by being a soldier, I may wind up putting myself in harm's way. I may be mobilized to go to the front in some war. But did it occur to you that when you join God's army, that you might be putting yourself in harm's way? Have you read the Bible about what happens to God's soldiers? Some of them didn't do too well. What about you? Joyce Meyer said, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. I'm concerned that too many of us are comfortable in the boat. Jesus has something unique and special for each one of us to do. Not just our collectivism, but on an individual basis. There's somebody right now making a decision about a career, making a decision about education, making a decision about crossing the room just to speak to somebody they don't like. 
Could it be that your destiny, that why you are here, according to scripture, is the ministry of reconciliation? As we celebrate these emblems now, the broken body of Jesus has purchased our salvation. We read from scripture in 1 Corinthians 6.20, For we are bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And even before we understand what Edmund Burke said, here's what Paul said. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We were created beforehand for good works. So here's my last word. I am fully aware of the issues that preceded me in this church. There's been some hurt. There's been some harm. Thank you. There's been harm in this church. Some of you don't trust each other. Some of you are convinced that the devil's up in here. So in these good works that we've been called to do, some of these good works must be performed in the context of loving, I'm sorry, loving and forgiving each other. That's why we're here today. I want to challenge this church. God wants to do something uniquely special for his people in these last days, in these evil times. But if we're not prepared to love and forgive, that specialness will never occur. The Bible teaches that the Father forgives us as we forgive others. By the way, you have to forgive before somebody comes to you and asks to be forgiven. Do you know that the Bible never commanded that you be loved? But a lot of people leave churches, I understand, because they say, well, I went to that church and, and nobody loved me. The Bible didn't say that you have to be loved. It only has one commandment, that you love others. If you don't feel loved, then go love somebody. Give somebody a hug. Do you know when you hug somebody, you're hugging yourself? It feels good. So the question we'll close with. Are you walking in your destiny? My testimony is that God has led me to places that I've never thought I would be because I said yes. And if you say yes to God, he will take your life in directions that you cannot even imagine. Are you prepared to say yes this morning? Bow your heads with me as we close this message. Lord, I pray for our congregation. We must leave the past behind us and step forward into the destiny we've been called. There are men and women that you're waiting to move forward in their lives. There's a specific person, ministry, act, duty that you outlined before creation for every one of us. And it may not be just one duty. It may be a, a whole set of things that we'll do in our course of our lifetimes directed by you. This is how we make impact for the kingdom of God. Lord, help us not to look back, but to look forward. Help us not to be fearful, but to be trusting. For all your biddings are enablings. 
and what you command, you bless. With every head bowed now and every eye closed, there may be someone here who recognizes that you have not walked into your destiny. But you want to commit yourself today that you are going to follow where God leads you. Just raise your hand and say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to go where you say, I've been reluctant in the past. But I'm going to go where you say go. God bless you. Lord, lead us, guide us, keep us. In the strong name of Jesus, let the church say, Amen.
For I receive from the Lord that I also pass on to you. The Lord, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had taken, give thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same he took the cup and, and said, This is a new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, uh, we come here today to uh, uh, give you all of our uh, sorrows, all of our fears, all of our anger, and we ask that you make us instruments of your love and that you remind us of the full uh, meaning of these symbols that uh, when we eat the bread and uh, drink the wine, we eat the body and the blood, we, we take your life into ours and uh, we become your hands and feet. Uh, bless these symbols today we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Has everyone been served? In the solemnness of this moment, the emblem of the bread representing the broken body of Jesus Christ. Whenever we're tempted to just forget who we really are, we need to just reflect on what it cost God to obtain our salvation. It cost God the life of his son, who unfortunately didn't die of old age. He was beaten and broken and murdered that we might live. Let us partake. the emblem of his blood and that cup which he promised that he would never partake of until he does so with us around that welcome table. I don't know about you, I can't wait to see Jesus and to partake of this emblem with him. It is the blood that washes away our sin. It is my prayer today that as we partake, when we leave this place, we will leave clean, refreshed, renewed. Let us partake together. God and Father. As we prepare now to sing our closing hymn, burn this experience today into our memories. When the going gets tough, when we're feeling low, may we never forget that we are sons and daughters. And as such, joint heirs of Jesus Christ. And the 
purchase for that was his blood. May it sober us. May it invigorate us. May it keep us walking in our destiny. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to remain seated to sing our closing song, and after our closing song, um, there will be an offering taken for the poor. We do this every quarter, and that offering will be taken at the door as you go out. The elders will be at the doors to shake your hands. Thank you so much for your spirit today in helping to make this service so memorable and so sacred. May God richly bless you. this place let your Holy Spirit go with us never forsake us and we pray that we will never forsake you may your blessings be upon us and your people in the name of Jesus we pray let everyone say amen, amen.